So, um, we'll start with uh, uh, with one recent question because I can do that very very quickly. And uh, this was a, a question um, which is about the uh, collapse of a shopping mall which happened in Riga. And uh, the question was, is there uh, special uh, spiritual significance to this disaster where 60 people died? And I researched it and um, the short answer is no. Um, but I'll, I'll tell a little bit about how you can look at, uh, at an, any event to see what's actually going on. Uh, so the first thing I did is to see if there are uh, death angels there. So spirits which are um, specialized in taking care of people who die. So if there is black magic involved or something like this, often the life force of the people or the spirits of the people will get trapped. And here the death angels were active, so the people who died were able to leave in a normal fashion. Um, I also found some pictures of the, uh, the site where it happened a few days before, and already the death angels were there waiting for it to happen. Uh, so it was very much a planned event, or event which was known that it would happen. Um, so, um, I also looked at the uh, surrounding areas to see if there are any angry nature spirits or other angry greater spirits. And yes, there are angry uh, uh, nature spirits around, but none of them are aggressive. They're just disgruntled, unhappy, dissatisfied, but none of them are overtly aggressive. So, they haven't been involved either. Um, I also looked if the place might be cursed, if this might have been an ancient holy place or something like this, but um, yeah, the energy level there is actually slightly lower than normal. There are no ley lines or other yeah, uh, energetic structures of any significance there, so it seems to be just a normal place. Um, I also had a look at um, the elemental spirit. What, uh, yeah, what feeling they had and they already noticed that in a way the element they were a part of, the, the structure of the building was already badly weakened several days before uh, the collapse. Um, so I had a look at the energy of the building itself and um, whenever you make something, something of the energy of the persons who make it or the surrounding energies gets infused into the material. So you can read an object to know a little bit about the previous owners. And you can do the same with the building. And what I could find is basically that the, the people who built it were not very happy, they were not very interested, they were not proud, um, they were a little bit lazy and just wanted to get home. Uh, so the most likely option is that um, apparently it was built on the cheap, using cheap labor, probably also cheap parts. So either the parts collapsed because they were cheap or the building collapsed because the work was not done well. Uh, so basically it is laziness and greed which caused 60 people to die and not some higher spiritual power or anything. At least not as far as I could find. Um, so, that's the long and short of um, um, yeah, the unfortunate collapse in, um, uh, in Riga. Okay, I'll see if I can get to the questions now. Um, because it seems that still... Yeah, my computer is acting up a bit. Mm -hmm. And what? Do you have questions? Yes. Okay, so there's a question if I could elaborate a little bit. 
on the process of how I got the information from the building. Um, it is not necessary to actually go into a trance state. Um, okay, I notice there is now a problem with the call, so I don't know what the internet is doing these days. Um, okay, it seems to be working again. Okay, um, so now it is not necessary to go into a trance state. It is necessary to go on the level of where the, the elemental spirits reside. Um, so uh, most people can uh, can talk quite easily with the higher level of, of spirits. So um, a nature spirit, uh, a spirit guides, deceased people. These are relatively easy because they are more similar to us in consciousness. Uh, elemental spirits are more uh, more simple in consciousness. They can be very powerful, but they're also much more uh, primitive in a way. Um, and it is in a way just as you can elevate your consciousness by, by meditation, by nice food, you can also lower your consciousness to get more on this uh, elemental level. And elemental spirits are quite, uh, quite simple. Um, they follow, they're always watching the higher energies and they try to gather what they should do from it. They want to be led, they want to be instructed so they can get involved in greater processes. Um, so it is quite easy for the elemental spirits to hear us. It is a little bit more difficult for us to hear them. Um, and these elemental spirits, they record energies because they're always listening, but they don't always comprehend what they're recording or what the energies are which they are picking up. Um, but they can, in a way, play it back to us. But elemental spirits are also a little bit slow. So generally events which, um, which happened um, a few weeks or a few months ago, they probably won't have noticed or won't have recorded it. It is only if something is said to them very specifically or has been going on for yeah, several months or several years that they really notice something. Um, you also get their attention if you um, transform the object. Uh, yes, is there a question? Okay, I hear an open mic, but no question. Okay. Um, so, um, these elemental spirits, um, during the construction of an object or during the transformation of an object, they tend to pay extra attention, but in the meanwhile they're not paying attention. This is quite normal because, well, if you're a stone, well, the weather changes every day, there's different animals walking by every day. So these small changes, they tend to kind of even out. And yeah, they do see things as climates or cultures, but usually individual things are not that much of an interest to them. Okay, I see that there are problems with the call. Uh, I'll try to add some people back. Still got lost. Okay, I hope that everybody is back online now. Um, so, sorry about that, don't know exactly what happened. Uh, and if you missed a part, I, yeah, I'll at least send the link to the lesson around. So, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so I was talking a little bit about elemental spirits. So elemental spirits, they uh, come in, in yeah, uh, basically uh, four flavors: uh, earth, water, uh, and air, and fire. And um, any object or even person has a mix of these elements. And some also greater elemental spirits and nature spirits and our own spirits. They're actually made up out of several of the elements. Um, and also greater elemental spirits also contain energies of other elements. Um, and talking to elemental spirits is a talent which is um, a little bit of a, of a lost art in, uh, in modern days or in, in modern people. Uh, for me personally I have some uh, memories of an incarnation in which I was a stone. So I spent some time and I remember it well as an elemental spirit. So that uh, makes it easy for me to, uh, to go back into it. Uh, but anyway, um, elemental spirits are quite good at listening to us, even though we're not as good at listening to them. And usually if you hold an object and you ask a question, of like, okay, what was the energy a month ago, a year ago, 10,000 years ago? Uh, if the elemental spirit has a record of that, then it will show it to you or give it back to you. So many people already use this intuitively by picking up the atmosphere of a building or reading the history of a building, um, which is can be done by listening to the elements or can also be done by going into the astral. And if you go into the astral, it's a little bit um, indeed more of a trance thing. But um, talking with an element, uh, you can do that quite well from your body. You just lower your consciousness. You don't your own consciousness and the con consciousness limitations of your body are not stopping you from talking with elements, they are stopping you from talking to higher spirits. Okay, um, I have four more questions which are left over from last week. And, well, this is a um, a rather uh, interesting question. Uh, can you tell about the Christ consciousness? Is this the correct word? Should we say Christ teaching? And what is the role of Mary? Is Mary not a form of an earlier deity? Um, well, that is an interesting thing because in a way the, uh, um, a lot of the, the teachings of, of Christ um, come from various sources. Um, so what we call the teaching of Christ has a roots in the uh, Judaic tradition, in Judaism. And in Judaism uh, there basically uh, is on, in a way one God, one creator God, but he is seen as having four aspects. So uh, the father, the mother, the son and the daughter. Um, so it is in a way a little bit uh, uh, similar to uh, the Celtic religion where also the, um, the reality is seen as having four aspects, or five aspects, I'm sorry, uh, where you have the male in the form of the, of the young god and the old god, and the female in the form of the, uh, uh, the maiden, uh, uh, the mother, and the crone. Um, but ultimately it doesn't matter because um, in many uh, polytheistic systems they actually just use different um, different ways of relating with, with God and they use the way which relates most to their own personal relationship. So um, do you look upon God as your father? Well then you are the child of God. If you look upon God as the mother, you're also the child of God, but with a very different relationship. Is God acting motherly to you? Well, then you see God as a feminine a structure. And if God is acting fatherly, like these are the rules and these are the things you should do, then God is more of a father role. But there can also be a lot more equality, or there can be a role for you as a caretaker then if you have a role to take care of all the of all creation, of all the animals, the children, the plants, the stones, and God is as your child, and you have 
a father's love or a mother's love towards, uh, towards the divine manifestations. So not so much towards the Absolute itself, but definitely to the manifestations of the Absolute. Um, if we want to look at the uh, specific teachings uh, in, the, in Christianity, a lot of the teachings come from Judaism. Um, a lot of them also come from, uh, from Sufism. And uh, could you stop kicking the table, please, because the camera is moving. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Um, so some of the teachings come from Judaism. Some of them come from um, uh, Sufism. And also a lot of uh, uh, teachings come from the Mitras cultures. Uh, Mitras was is basically um, a, a deity of light, and um, there are different stories whether it is in origin Persian or in origin uh, 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 Indian. Uh, uh, so from India, uh, a Vedic god. Um, what it has in common is that it is seen uh, just like uh, Ahura Mazda as a god of light. Uh, a person who, in a way, opposes darkness um, and tries to uh, remove darkness. So, you know, already we have a very much an idea, um, a pre-Christian idea of salvation, of that darkness is, is hindering us, limiting us, trapping us, and that this darkness should disappear so that we can reach a state of light or enlightenment. And these ideas which are originating uh, uh, from India and Persia, they come to the West and they're uh, absorbed in our uh, uh, Christian religion. And I think that this is very much the, um, the essence. So uh, Jesus uh, um, was known as Christos. And uh, Christos is basically a Greek word which means the anointed one. The one who has been blessed, who has been chosen, who has been selected, who has been uplifted. And um, uh, Christianity is basically the art of being chosen, of being uplifted, of how to be like Christ, how to become uplifted as well, how to be transformed from a normal man, a carpenter, into a child of God. Um, and this is very much the, the, the essence of, of the Christian teaching and the Mitras teachings and the Ramazda teachings and the Sufi teachings. Um, the process of, of self-transformation by trying to receive the light, by trying to focus on the light, receiving this impulse. And uh, this can be done in a, in a masculine way and this can be done in a feminine way. Uh, the masculine way is very much um, uh, talked about in the Bible as Jacob's ladder. So there is a vision which uh, Jacob has of the angels which are uh, going back and forth between the heavens and the earth. And um, this is very much a, a masculine way of focusing on this ladder, of looking at, look, okay, where am I now? What is below me? What is above me? And what should, skills should I develop, what willpower should I develop to reach the next step on the ladder? And uh, what are the challenges and really to be like a hero, like a fighter, work hard and manage to get to the next step and slowly but surely climb your way up to the heavens. So this is the masculine aspect. Um, if you look at the Grail tradition, uh, this is very much the feminine aspect. So the feminine aspect is not so much that you try to go up there, which is in a way mirrored by also the shamanic tradition of trance traveling, which is also very much a tradition which is focused on discipline, on control of the personal energy body. But um, the feminine tradition, the grail tradition, is a much more mystical tradition. So it is much more about receiving the impulses which are already being sent to the earth and transforming a place or yourself or a group into a grail which is a cup which can hold this impulse, which can draw this impulse to itself like a magnet. So there is indeed also a part of working on yourself, 
and purifying yourself so that this impulse can be received and can be attracted. This is very much, in a way, the, the, the role of Mary, um, uh, the feminine. Um, so she's not so much the one who, um, who teaches us how to, to reach the heavens or how to ascend, but who rather teaches us how to uh, receive blessings. So Mary is seen as the, the, the lady of compassion, uh, the lady of mercy, the lady of protection. And um, all these things are about the higher impulse coming to the earth, coming to the beings which are in a fallen state, and how we should be able to harness this, this blessings of Mary um, in our own lives, in our own churches, in our own cities, in our own families. So this is very much the, the role of Mary. So um, I think that's if you look at, at the words, the Christ teaching would be better than the Christ consciousness. Um, because the Christ consciousness would be a consciousness of um, that there is light and darkness and that there is light and darkness in us and um, that there is a process of this going on. But this consciousness already um, yeah, existed uh, before before Christ, it was already a hermetic consciousness. Um, so that's not that new. Um, if you look at the, the issue, like, is Mary not the form of an earlier deity? Um, yes and no. In a way, in, in many places already the, uh, the goddess was worshipped. As, uh, as the creator, so the, they saw the creator as a, as a feminine force. And when Christianity came, they continued to venerate the goddess. But, uh, well, not to end up yeah, burned at the stake for being pagans or other things, they started to venerate the goddess in the form of Mary, um, or in the form of Anna, Mary, Mary's mother. Um, so. Of course, there are many places in which the veneration of Mary, it's actually the veneration of sometimes even a local goddess or a local nature spirit, which has taken the guise or the mantle of Mary. And it's this also the same with the worship of Christ or uh, saints. In many areas they, they worshipped a, a local nature spirit or a local god, and well, they just gave him the form of a saint or the form of Christ. Um, so is the worship pure in every place? Is every church uh, pure in its devotion to the highest absolute? No. Uh, this is definitely not true, but neither should it be true. Because also these nature spirits, they can uh, be servants of the absolute, or of the Holy Spirit, or of uh, Christ. And they have a very important task. And humanity has been very good at, in a way, doing away with all the other servants, uh, doing away with the nature spirits, doing away with other lesser beings, and saying, like, no, we should focus only on the absolute, only on the highest impulse. But in a way, by not supporting and stopping to listen to all these other powers, we are, in a way, engaging in an act of hubris, which is pride and thinking that we are better, we don't need them anymore, we can do without. I do only need uh, the, the voice of the Absolute and all other things I can do myself. I don't need to listen to lesser gods, I don't need nature spirits to take care of the country for me or the forest for me, I can do that by myself. But we do away with a lot of these powers, but we don't um, take the responsibility because if you stop listening to that power that means that you have to take care of the country of the stones of the spirits of the rivers uh, of the dead uh, all the tasks which usually the, these lesser spirits are doing and we're not doing that which is creating a big mess so a lot of you know unpure spirits hanging around a lot of dead people who can't move on because there's nobody to guide them anymore nobody to show them away the way anymore so in a way we're very much uh, polluting our own nest, destroying the energetic structure of our planet by also by mining and disrupting the energy flows in the earth. 
Um, so yeah, we're really wrecking the place in a very good way through our pride and ignorance. Um, so, okay, that's the first question. Okay, uh, and there's another really interesting question about the marital oath. Hmm. How does the marital oath between spouses actually work? Are people truly bound with each other for incarnations? What happens if a man marries a different woman in every incarnation? Well, and the opposite is also quite interesting. Um, so there are options. Um, usually most oaths are only last a lifetime. So. Um, also in, in the, 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 the Catholic tradition and Protestant tradition, you marry until death do us part. So you marry only for a lifetime. So that also means that at the end of the lifetime you're free again. But in Orthodox tradition uh, you marry forever. So it is a much deeper bond, really a bond of the spirit, which gets tied up together. And that doesn't mean that in the next life you are necessarily born as man and wife again or need to marry again, but you are intertwined. So you can be born as somebody's child or as somebody's dog or somebody's cat because your spirits are intertwined and will automatically gravitate to each other, will be remain interlinked. Um, so you do see that these bonds we make through our oaths, through our vows, uh, they are acted out in the in next incarnations, but not always in the same scheme, so not always in the husband-wife scheme. Um, you can also even be born as enemies, which is also a very intimate bond, uh, as arch-enemies. Um, so the, um, the oath which, uh, which you take is basically um, uh, a very interesting structure because um, normally you are guided by your own uh, free will, by your own willpower. And when you take an oath, you're basically saying, okay, instead of following my own willpower, I will now actually uh, uh, create a little province which is of power to myself. And uh, this part of my being will be controlled by another power, according to my oath. So instead, instead of saying like, gosh, I will marry with who I want uh, and I will do that according to my wishes and desires and my will every life, you're basically saying like, no, I will make a contact with contract with this spirit and I will not touch this contract myself. I will give this contract to another power, which is not me, to watch over it. So a vow cannot really work very well unless there is another power which is willing to accept the vow, which is willing to accept the control over that part of your life. So if you say, I vow it, I promise it, but you don't call upon another power, you don't call upon a god or goddess or the absolute or even uh, one of your spirit guides to sustain that vow, that basically means you're not taking care of it, neither is any other power taking care of it, and usually that means your subconscious or another spirit or some other being will start working with the spirit of uh, that part of your being of which you have lost control. And then all kinds of things can start happening. Um, because depending on which power yeah, takes control over the part of your being, well, you're kind of at the mercy of that power because you gave up your personal control. So if you make a vow, it is very important that you select a very good recipient for the part of your being which you're handing to them. Um, and um, there is a very big difference also between, in a way, uh, breaking a vow and uh, a relinquishing a vow. So breaking a vow is uh, not a very good thing. For instance, if I uh, would take a vow of poverty and I say like, okay, I want a higher power to take control of all my possessions for me and I will not worry about that, the, the gods will watch over me and I will just live whatever 
which whatever is around me or in front of me. I make no claim of ownership to the physical world. Um, and um, I invite these powers to come and to take control of it. And if I then say like, no, but this cup is mine and this is my house and this is my sweater, you're basically saying that my power, my will, is higher than that of the gods um, which I have given the vow to. And you're saying like, okay, these gods are controlling my possessions, but I will control them. It is possible, if you're enlightened, to do such a thing. If you're not enlightened, this is usually not a very good step to make. Because you're in a way, again, showing hubris, showing pride, overstepping your boundaries and saying that your will, uh, your desire, your insight is higher and more important and better than that of the gods or other powers you invited. And if you make a vow to the Absolute, like, gosh, I want to be, um, um, this um, wife or husband should be the only one I have sex with uh, during this incarnation and you have sex with another, then you're saying like, gosh, my actually my own uh, ideas or desires and will to have sex with somebody or even yeah, my instincts, they're more important to me and higher to me than is the Absolute. So, actually, if you break a vow, the sin or the, the trespass of breaking the vow is in direct correspondence to the power which is holding the vow for you. Um, and if you break a vow, then um, this is extremely heavy karma. This will not reflect very well on your standing or on your position um, within the cosmos. And you will often lose the friendship and the help of the power which uh, uh, you made the vow with because you've shown that you're unwilling to follow their guidance, unwilling to relinquish yourself uh, in their care. So you really break your, your contract with that part of the cosmos. And um, yeah, these are very, very happy things to, to happen. Um, relinquishing a vow. Uh, is very different. Relinquishing a vow is basically saying like gosh for a while I've not taken control of this thing I've let another power control it but I feel ready now to take control over it again. So for instance um, I have a horrible love life uh, terrible I get fall in love with the wrong women evil women and I get totally depressed or aggressive and I beat them up and anyway I can see clearly that like relationships are not meant for me. Then I can take a vow of, uh, of celibacy and say okay I'll go in a monastery or at least I won't get into relationships anymore and this whole part of me which wants to get into relationships which has all these desires, this part of me I will give by my vow into keeping to another being. And maybe I grow, I learn, I understand my earlier mistakes and after a few years I feel ready. I'm like, okay, I think now I can get into a relationship without being blinded by lust or without getting too overpowering or fearful or aggressive or whatever. And then you can say to the power, okay, could I have control back please? And usually the power which you gave the control to will give it back. Because, yeah, it's, it's just doing you a favor by taking control over it. And if you want to learn by going into a more complex life, okay, that is fine. Uh, to give it a try. And if you fail, okay, you can give it back to it. And in this case, you're not really upsetting anything or ruining your relationship with the power. So relinquishing a vow is also a heavy thing, of course. To say, like, gosh, I will reintegrate or take control back over that part of my life after having neglected it for a while. So it is usually a slow process in which gradually you start having more control and the other power starts taking steps back. Um, so your life becomes more complex. You can look upon it a little bit as breathing. So if you're not paying attention, your body will breathe for you. And in the same way, the power which has, um, uh, yeah, which you have given the vow to, 
has control over that part of your life, but you can also breathe consciously and you know, take control back uh, from that power. So that's a little story about vows. What happens if a man marries a different woman in every incarnation? Well, for a man it's usually not that significant. Uh, men are by nature very f focused and often focused on their own desires, on their own goals, on their work um, and who they're with, even uh, who they're with on the most intimate level, tends not to impact them very much. Um, so they're relatively insensitive and they can easily deal with, with different partners or different situations or different, different circumstances and still keep their focus on what they were doing, who they were, yeah, what their purpose is. Uh, for women it is much more difficult if they, uh, they switch partners, both during the life and over incarnations. Because if you have a, a feminine structure, um, the uh, sensitivity is about two or three times as high as it is when you're in a, in a male body, in a male energy body. So everything impacts you uh, with a lot more force. So you can't really um, ignore your surroundings or your partner as much as a man can. Um, and as a result, your partner or the, your family or your surroundings are uh, much more important to your development, to your spiritual growth. Then on the one hand it's an advantage uh, because you have a lot more impulses, but on the other hand it's a disadvantage because the chances of being distracted or sidetracked or losing your way are also a lot higher because of this yeah, deeper interaction. So ultimately there, there is an ideal balance between how um, flexible or how rigid you should be and this is also why it is good if you are too flexible as a woman to have a man who keeps you focused on what are our goals what is our purpose both for me and for you and how to you know, really work on that and not to get distracted and in the same for a man it is good to have a woman around so you get a lot of new impulses and you, you notice more, you see more, you feel more than you otherwise would because you're otherwise too limited and unable to, to open up or to comprehend the surroundings uh, by just not yeah, giving enough attention to them because they're easily ignored for you as an, a male being. Um, I want to see if there are any more questions on vows or the marriage because it's a rather complex uh, story. Um, just one general thing also about uh, relationships. Um, as human beings we have seven chakras which in a way show our personality and to be satisfied in a relationship we need at least three or four chakras to really interact with the person we are with. We really need to feel stimulated and contact and to be seen on, yeah, at least half of our being needs to, needs to be in that relationship. And if uh, you can also have a very strong attraction just on based on one or two chakras, but usually those types of relationships or infatuations can be very strong, but ultimately they're not satisfying on the long term. So you should realize if only one or two chakras are feeling interested or um, after a while only one or two chakras are left within the relationship then your spirit is not being satisfied and then yeah, it might be time to find a more satisfying relationship. Um, so the remark is so children can make vows too. Well yes. Uh, it is possible, but it is also slightly more difficult. Um, in general, it is not a good idea for a person to make a vow until their personality is really complete. Um, because uh, a vow is uh, stronger or weaker depending on the harmony. So if I make a vow and I want it on an instinctive level, on an emotional level, on a mental level, on a 
ego level and on a spiritual level, then it is very solid and it is very easy for me uh, to, um, uh, to do that because in a way control over all these levels which I have myself gained I can then give to another power but if I do not yet have self-control I also cannot give that control to another power so the quality of the vow is in direct relation to the amount of self-control which you have or self-awareness which you have um, so in general it is frowned upon for children to make vows or promises and only when a person yeah, is mature enough or adult enough to have a good enough self-awareness then a vow is seen as, uh, as useful but a, children, a child can make a vow and in a more limited fashion it will also work um, but yeah, it, it's also a, a little bit like, um, in a way, marrying children off when they're eight years old. Um, yes, of course you can put two, two children in front of a priest and yeah, uh, lock their spirits in together for life, but um, in modern days we feel that it should be a conscious choice rather than something inflicted upon them. Also, um, a little bit, it's like any, any decision, like if, there's, uh, if you want to go somewhere, if you want to follow a path, and there's internal division in your being, so part of you wants to do it, part of you doesn't want to do it, then the part which is rebellious or unstable sooner or later will trip you up or will make you fall. So any decision, major life decision, such as a vow, or accepting a master or a teacher, or joining a spiritual group, uh, should only be done when you're in a very good uh, state, a very aware state, and a very harmonious, balanced state, with all of your being being in agreement with the important step which you're taking. Because otherwise you're just setting yourself up to fail, and that's bad karma, because it's basically hubris, um, thinking that you're better than you really are. So, yeah, there's the remark of um, yeah, making vows when you're young. It is uh, indeed quite possible. And uh, what you can do is also to renew your vows. So as you grow um, um, spiritually and in consciousness and in self-control, you can rededicate yourself. You can say like, okay, I made this promise when I was young make this promise when I'm older and I continue making this promise at several stages in my life and the vow will grow in strength and also the powers which you involve in the vow um, can also become higher or greater or bigger because you are able to communicate with higher or greater powers and to earn their respect throughout your life so yeah you can definitely build vow upon vow and deepen it Okay, so now the vowels have become clear, we move to the next subject, which is very much in line with that. It's about spiritual missions. What can spiritual missions be like? What kind of missions are there? And what determines that a person has a mission? Can a mission be unconscious? So, um, roughly about the, the kinds of missions, there are, uh, they are basically in two categories. Uh, one of them is self-transformation and the other is a transformation of uh, something which is not yourself. Um, so, uh, in a way, uh, self-transformation is seen as the path of evolution, of improving your consciousness, of um, reconnecting to the Absolute, because self-transformation is generally seen as trying to 
um, improve your being, trying to increase your consciousness. Um, this is not always true. Sometimes people want to uh, learn lower powers or learn uh, certain sins or heavier vibrations. But also, ultimately, the complexity of the being will increase, not necessarily the harmony or the awareness, but it's an investment into the future. Because, for instance, if you're born and you learn laziness or you learn envy, um, yeah, your quality, your consciousness can decrease, your harmony can decrease, but ultimately by learning to incorporate this energy and learning how to work with it and deal with it, you can regain your harmony, your awareness, and then you will have more. So it is, yeah, sometimes you make an investment and that has a cost. And the cost is a decreased awareness or a decreased vibration. But ultimately it can pay off, but also an investment has a risk. So it can also be that it's yeah, not worth the cost or um, yeah, it has very negative side effects by investing too much, more than you can bear. Um, about the mission of transforming um, the world or other beings. So one of the things can be uh, a mission of assistance. So if you indeed are married uh, and you make the promise to uh, uh, protect a person or to support them in sickness and in health, uh, then you can be reborn just to help this person you made a promise to or you made a vow to. Uh, so people can be born as helpers or healers or protectors and this can be in a very direct individual sense but people can also be born as healers, protectors uh, of a place or of a country or of a group of people or of a family or even of a religion or an egregore. Um, so these are all uh, manifestation missions. Often a manifestation mission is a little bit um, different because most people are interested in, in self-development, especially in this um, uh, rather uh, luciferical times. And people who are born with a manifestation mission, they only want to learn what they need to do their job. So their focus is not so much on self-improvement, but just in doing their work well and Unfortunately, to do the work well, they need actually how to learn how to do the work and to improve themselves. So it's more personal growth is more as a side effect than a goal in itself. Um, so what a mission is like? It is often um, uh, shown as a as an interest or a, or a passion. Um, for instance, in in my case. Uh, one of the, the yeah the the missions I have been on is in a way to to work with uh, the energetic structure of uh, of this planet of the Earth, and you can do this in in yeah many forms in forms of many species, and um, ultimately uh, as when I was young I was very interested in architecture I still am. And this is like how do all the parts fit together? How can a whole be improved by working on one small part? So there's a building, but well, if you change the paint or the roof line or the windows, the whole building becomes different. It gets a different character, everything shifts, everything gets a different meaning. And it's the same in stories, like if you, or in movies, if a person dresses differently or says a different line. So I'm very interested. In small things which, which have big effects and um, in a way this lifelong interest is a reflection of uh, the mission of my spirit to do a very similar work and uh, the work I do on a spiritual level is mirrored in this interest on a physical level on a material level um, so this is one of the ways of uh, how a person can realize a mission um, also, it's often felt as a, as a desire, like, gosh, I want to be with that person or live in this place. And yeah, you just feel more at home, more at peace. Uh, and usually if you're following your mission, then your spirit has a contentment. 
that doesn't mean that your life is easy. It also doesn't mean that you're happy or everything is going well. But that means that your spirit feels that it is working on what it is working. And even though with this heart there is a kind of a satisfaction there, a kind of a peace there, on a very deep level. And if you are, in a way, off track and not following your mission, then you can have lots of things, but there's an emptiness there, there's a hunger there, there's a dissatisfaction which no yeah, ego powers can fill or can compensate. And there's often um, uh, also a struggle between the spirit and the ego. Because the ego is usually never interested in the mission. It's there to make you, as an incarnated being, survive, live and thrive and feel safe, feel secure. And the mission is usually challenging, whether it's a mission of self-improvement or a mission to serve others or serve other powers. And um, it's really a, a challenge for the spirit to start to mold and change the ego so it becomes an ally in fulfilling that mission, rather than an obstacle to doing so. Um, so every person is actually born with a mission. If we had no purpose, we would not have been granted access to our solar system, we would not have been granted an incarnation. Uh, but it is very tough to remember this. So usually the easiest way to get remembrance of what is our spirit doing here is actually to go back and ask the person who remembers, which is either your spirit or the solar spirit who granted you access. So one of the exercises you can do is um, uh, you lie on the floor and you leave your body, you, so you go in, an, in, an, in a trance and then you go into an astral travel. And your astral body needs to be at least 300 meters away from the surface of the Earth. Because you need to free yourself from all the, the memories, the energies, the culture, the thoughts, all these influences which is in a way trapping your spirit. Your spirit needs to be free. And if possible it should actually go halfway between uh, uh, the Earth and the Moon. Really suspend yourself between these two powers so that you are in a way in a balance between your incarnated self and your subconscious self. And then you add the third element, which is the solar impulse, the, the conscious impulse of the, of the spirit, which is self-aware. And then you go in this triangle, in a way, earth, moon, sun. And while you're suspended in this triangle, you focus your attention um, on the solar, uh, solar impulse. And you can ask the solar impulse, like, what is the reason for my existence here? What's part of this solar power, which is ultimately the, trans the power of transformation, the power of awareness of the spirit, the journey of the spirit? What is my goal? What is my purpose? And um, try to feel the solar impulse within your being. Because this is the highest impulse in our energy bodies as they exist in our incarnated form or within our um, within the solar system. And uh, this solar impulse then has to be translated into what does it mean for me as a human being? What does it mean for me as a male human being? What does it mean for me as a male human being in a Western culture, in this time frame, in this so it's slowly but surely as you start going back to your incarnation, the solar impulse has to be translated into what does that mean for me now. So, um, and this is also in a way the most holy, the most sacred part of your being. Um, this is also related to your spiritual name or your initiatory name. Um, it's the essence in a way which guides all your incarnations. So uh, the mission, finding your mission, is, a, yeah, is a, a, an extremely important task. It is in a way the task. And remembering it during all your lives and keeping working on it during all your lives is what ultimately creates yeah, the spiritual growth, both in yourself and in the world, and in our solar system and in the cosmos at large. So this is the spiritual work. 
Um, so, can a mission be unconscious? Um, yes, it is often the case, especially if the if the earthly powers, if the uh, because the impulses from the body, if you're in pain or you're hungry, or um, the ego is very strong, that's in a way pushes away all, all awareness. And also, if your subconsciousness is very much in control, you just do things. Uh, without knowing why, then you can still follow your mission, but the subconsciousness is not always very reliable because it is a mix of impulses. And often also in your subconsciousness there will be the desires of other powers, the powers which are around you, um, which are astral impulses from maybe the people, the country, the religion you are a part of, family members, loved ones. And so the subconscious is also can be quite muddled. So, but the, your mission is in there, in your subconscious, but it is not always ruling the subconscious. Because these other impulses can be stronger than the solar impulse. So, are there more um, questions on the mission? Because this is also a very essential question. Yes, uh, it's a big step to try to do astral traveling and try to learn, yes, it is, because also to really work with the solar impulse, you also have to, it's in a way the last step, you have to conquer all the other planetary impulses. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about the earth impulse, which is really the impulses of the physical body. You have to understand the physical body and your spirit has to, in a way, master the physical body. So it doesn't, isn't, it's no longer blocked by it. Uh, the mercurial impulse is the impulse of the thoughts, of the minds. Uh, the Venus impulse is the impulse of the, um, in a way, the, the receptive side of you, how sensitive you are. And controlling your own sensitivity. The Mars impulse is how magical you are. Uh, controlling the energies which emanate from you. Um, the Jupiter impulse is working with uh, with blessings. The Saturn impulse is learning how to work with obstacles, with challenges. Um, the lunar impulse is learning how to deal with all the things which are out of touch for your consciousness and which is usually the, la the larger part of your being. And uh, so it's quite a challenge for to really reach this solar impulse and to, to get very clear on that. So you have to work with all the planetary powers, with all the planetary um, uh, spirits uh, or titans of the planets, which are both male and female. So it is not so that like Venus is female, Mars is male, they both have male and masculine and feminine aspects. And some of them have multiple spirits, like the Sun, which has six. Uh, some have fewer, only one, like the Earth. Or some. So, but you don't have necessarily have to master all aspects. But there has to be a working relationship between your spirit and the planet. So working with astrology is really the, the key to self-knowledge, but also the key to self-liberation. Learning how the in a way the, the current set of powers is influencing you, is in a way trapping you and learning how to escape that, learning how to escape or transform your own personality, to transcend your own personality. And only if you can liberate yourself from yourself, uh, then you're able to really gain knowledge of this sort of impulse and to incarnate it completely. And basically this is also very much the, the Christ teaching or the Mitra's teaching or the Ahura Mazda teaching that we should focus on the light, on the sun to guide us. And all these other lower planets, they're in a way filters. So um, they let 
the solar impulse pass, but it's like a prism, so it gets a little bit twisted, a little bit colored, and um, it becomes very hard to recognize and through all these filters. And we, when we understand all these filters, we can still be the same person, but we can, in a way, unfilter it so that we can see the essence of it again, see the purity of it again. But already, if you train yourself in ascending, in slowly leaving the astral plane of the Earth, then you're already practicing in leaving behind a lot of filters, which are not necessarily your own filters, but the filters which are imposed on us by our history, by um, whatever happened on the Earth. And in a way, releasing these filters in yourself is very, sim very similar to releasing yourself from these astral filters of the place and time in which you live. It's a very similar process, so it's a very good practice just to do astral travelings like that. Okay, so then we move on to the last question. Um, are egregores rather mechanical or do they possess human qualities? Can we implore them to receive forgiveness if we have acted against the values and goals of an egregore? Well, um, it's a little bit of both, but mainly mechanical. So um, ultimately an egregore is governed by a higher power, which is usually an angel, which can be of course a light angel, but also a fallen angel um, in many cases, or gods or goddesses, or ascended masters. Uh, there are higher beings guiding it. and. Um, but the masters who guide it, they basically um, govern it within a rule of law. Um, so it is like the king who has certain decrees and certain laws. And of course the king can decide to rule differently. He or she can make an exception or change a law. But it's generally not the case. So usually an egregore will act in a mechanistic fashion and not in a very humanoid uh, fashion. Um, it's also very much about stability. Um, because when a group becomes larger, and I want to post a little uh, yeah, uh, YouTube movie on this, I'll try to do that this weekend. Uh, so, But as a group grows larger, there is more and more need for um, harmonizing energies to keep the group a group instead of just a collection of individuals or a collection of things. So um, the guidance uh, uh, in a way is often translated or needs to be translated into a certain limitation, things which are forbidden or things which are promoted. Um, so there is a little uh, twist going on. Things become less completely free and uh, this is the essence of laws within within a country, but also the essence of organization within a structure or a company or uh, any larger body of, of being. So uh, you do find though that um, uh, on the lighter side and especially in the uh, Michaelic uh, um, inspired egregores, it's, it's a lot more anarchistic and a lot more um, relying on, on the personal guidance. So it is basically saying that um, if you are able to attune to the Absolute and receive guidance from that or from the Holy Spirit or from an angel, uh, then we don't need laws because you will know or remember or feel what you should do. So there is no need um, for it. But especially in the, in the lower egregores, uh, there's a lot more need for guidance. So the amount of flexibility of the egregore is very much dependent on um, yeah, uh, or the, the nature of the egregore, from which, which cosmos does it stem, but also the quality of the egregore. Because even um, yeah, egregores which are from a nature or a divine cosmos, when they're very primitive, they will have more laws or more customs uh, integrated in them than when they're high. And, uh, but also very high um, 
egregores uh, from the Arimanic cosmos. Um, although they are a lot freer than the than the more prim primitive egregores from the Arimanic cosmos, they also tend to be much more structured, much more mechanistic in uh, in nature. Um, when it comes to imploring forgiveness, um, usually it's what what an egregore does is, is um, if a person is not cooperating or actually harming the egregore, uh, banishment is usually um, the typical punishment. So they don't really go after you or take revenge or um, this is relatively uncommon. Uh, darker egregores sometimes see a person as a source of power or slave and they might not want to let you go but um, yeah but if we 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 keep talking about the the light side of the cosmos usually they just say like okay um, if you want to go somewhere else or do something else that is fine do it without us because we're going this way feel free to go another way um, and if you want to rejoin, if you say like, okay, I've been the other way, I've looked at it, and it's a dead end, or it's no longer interesting, I want to come with you again, they will simply reab reabsorb you. So it's generally not really uh, an issue in the light cosmos. Um, they do require a certain uh, certain quality of you, also depending upon the position you want to take up in the, in the egregore, but I think we spoke about that earlier. Um, what you do see is that um, the more you work with an egregore, um, uh, the more close your ties will be. So in general a person has like one or one set of egregores which they really work with and there's others who are you know, kind of their friends with but they don't actually work for them or try to achieve their goals and um, in a way it, it's, it's like um, uh, there's a saying, all roads lead to Rome, so all roads lead to the Absolute, but you can only yeah, walk one way at a time, so only during your lifetime. You can only usually follow one egregore really well, and if you start to wonder, now this egregore, now that egregore, it can take a very long time until you get to Rome, <laughs> or until you really make headway towards the Absolute. So, just like any path, um, you can combine similar paths, but it is better to do things sequentially than all, all at the same time. Uh, because if you do something for a while, you can really build up some understanding, some level, um, pass some threshold, so you don't lose it all again if you lose that path, so that it really becomes integrated in your being. And it depends very much on the structure of your energy body, how long you need to be on a certain path until you reach that threshold level where your spirit really is transformed by following that path. Um, but generally it should, uh, the effects should be clear within months, not years. Weeks is too short. So if you follow a certain path and a religion or an egregore and you don't get results within a year, then it's probably not the right way for you to, to manifest yourself or to transform um, the world or uh, things like that. Okay, I see another question coming up. Yes, the guardian at the threshold. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a lot uh, published actually about the guardians of the threshold, um, both in, in ancient myth, in uh, fairy tales, but also in um, reports of astral journeys taken mainly during the 19th century. Um, the guardians of the threshold are very much um, um, in a way filters or um, switches, you could say. Um, there are certain areas which, due to your, your karma, um, you're allowed to go. 
So you've lived there, you've been there, uh, you know your way around. So you might not remember it completely, but you're free to, to go around wherever you please and that's just fine. But if you go into a new area, um, they want to know who are you, what are you doing here, should you be here, is it even safe for you to be here. And this is usually when you, uh, when you meet a, a guardian. And uh, the guardian is not a problem if you're supposed to be there, but it can be a problem if you're not supposed to be there. So in fairy tales it is often that um, yeah, you meet a dragon or a giant which you need to fight to reach the treasure or save the princess or whatever. But because the hero in the fairy tale is well prepared, he has, has his magical sword, his beams, his advice or allies or other things, he can overcome the challenge. And thus it is also with guardians of the threshold, it doesn't mean that you, it is impossible for you to pass a guardian, but it does mean you should be well prepared to face the guardian. Um, some guardians are, uh, uh, manifest themselves very much directly in the astral, but also uh, many guardians uh, prefer to arrange events in your life to, uh, to judge you, to see how you react or how your consciousness, what your consciousness is really like. So, and uh, the guardian often in a way judges you or sees what is your nature and then it sorts you onto a certain path or a certain region. Um, it can be, um, if, for those who love Harry Potter, you have the sorting hat which is put on that looks at the nature of the pupil and then says you belong to house Slytherin or Gryffindor. And in a very similar way, you also have guardians when it comes to, uh, to egregores, to solar systems, uh, to religions, to deities. And um, if you enter the realm of uh, gods or other solar systems or uh, egregores for the first time, you're very, very likely to encounter such a guardian at the threshold. And with every new um, consciousness level you reach, you also meet a guardian there. And um, especially places of power uh, or beings of power, uh, so saints, angels, uh, gods and goddesses, um, certain holy places will also have guardians of the, at the threshold, who will only grant you access to the energetical part. Um, if you have enough skill to understand it and to um, control the powers which are there, also to prevent you from harming yourself or others through lack of skill. Um, usually the, the, the simplest form of, uh, of tests these guardians will produce is a, a test of uh, control of your, of your energy body. So they will uh, generate fear or hunger or pain or uh, something else in you. And if you cannot overcome your own feelings, your own hunger, your own pain, if in a way your own energy body uh, can be turned against you, then usually they won't let you pass. You don't even belong in the astral if you can't make this challenge. Um, so I'm talking now about the, the collective astral. You can dream, you can, that's fine, but if you want to go into uh, the collective astral, then yeah, you really yeah, should be friends with your whole energy body. Uh, so this is usually the first and one of the most difficult uh, guardians, which keeps most people trapped in their uh, individual consciousness. Because if they would go out into the shared consciousness, they could also feel all the other pains and uh, and angers and whatever and if they can't deal with it they would go insane or suffer from the knowledge uh, which they gain about the world around them too much. Uh, so that's a very important guardian. Um, the uh, next form of guardian or challenger is usually the one you need to fight. Um, so it is not so much about like, um, in a way, you can already use your own body, it's no longer your enemy, but can you use it well? Because
because yeah, if you're sleeping or if it's passive, yeah, you're also at peace with it. But is it really a, a, a tool? Are you skillful at using your energy body? And it is not about like really winning or losing, because you might get eaten by by the guardian at the threshold. But still, it can gauge okay how well you fight, how skilled you are, and then it will let you pass. Maybe not to the highest realm because you might not be ready yet but at least to another realm, which is yeah, appropriate to your skill level. Um, a different type of guardian are not so much guardians who will, who will fight you, but will um, uh, test more or less your, your direction. So they will give you something, uh, often a paradox or a dilemma, and how do you choose? So you might have a dream or a real life occurrence, uh, like who do you save? Uh, do you save yourself, do you save your partner, or do you save your child? You cannot do all. And by the choices you make there, also you are sorted into a higher or lower uh, realm or to just a different religion or into a different egregore, depending on the, your own hierarchy of priorities your own uh, internal structure during your current incarnation. Okay, so that's a little bit about the guardian of the threshold, or guardians of the threshold. I see one more comment coming up. Yes, yeah, so you meet them again every step you make. Um, yes, this is very true. Um, but some of them will basically say like, okay, pass, because you've done so in, in, in previous lives. And if you actually get one to challenge you, that's very good news, because it means you're going somewhere new, somewhere you've never been before, so that you're actually really making spiritual progress. And in a way also the uh, planetary titans so your own personality are also guardians of the threshold in a way, which are keeping you from your, your solar consciousness. Um, but these guardians are, are in a way not your enemies, they're just there to, um, to in a way organize your, your path and your growth. Uh, it is possible to cheat guardians by the way. Um, there are sneak routes, there are different tricks and guises you can use, um, but it is generally not advised uh, to go against the rules. But especially in the, in the Dark Cosmos or in the teachings of the Dark Cosmos, uh, there are a lot of techniques. And usually this gives a certain level of knowledge and a certain level of power, but because the person is not ready for it, um, it tends to result in a negative karma which will manifest over the next incarnations. Um, it's a risk, but sometimes it pays off. Sometimes if you get this new power, um, which you can barely con control or comprehend, you will learn from it, and then you will make a giant step forward. But yeah, it's a very risky path, and the light side doesn't uh, condone it or advise it. And I describe the collective astral. Um, yeah. So what what happens is basically if you leave your um, the lowest sphere in a way of your personal astral is where you dream, and then you get slightly higher into the your personal astral, and this is where your imagination and your inspiration exit. And just above the level of inspiration. It's where you go into the collective, where you can uh, start to meet your guides and other people or go into collective dreams, where you meet yeah, the, the dream bodies of other people who are sleeping. And if you go higher up in the collective astral, you can actually also uh, meet the manifest astral manifestations of gods and of egregores. Um, yeah, how it feels to connect to it. 
Um, generally, the, when you enter into it, it is um, generally experienced as a sea of light or uh, an ocean or uh, a wide open space. There is a, a largeness about it because it encompasses yeah, all times and all places. And yet it is, in a way, uh, you can be alone in it uh, or you can be um, separated from everything and by just your wish you can join with everything. Um, so yeah, there's the feeling of connectivity. Uh, so often the connectivity is translated into light or water, but also the, the feeling of space. Yeah, collective um, doesn't mean necessarily that you feel all else, but that you have an ability to um, to connect to it. So it is a, a collective space, a shared uh, space, like you're living in the same house as housemates, uh, just like you're sharing the world. Uh, so you're an individual, but you share the world with the trees and the cats and the dogs and the horses. Uh, so in that sense collective and it is only when you go actually above the, the, the astral space then you get into the truly uh, collective consciousness uh, in a way the consciousness of which you are a fragment in which you are a part of but to go into the collective consciousness you really need to, to let go of your individual personality and this is basically what defines the, the border if you could say between the uh, the truly collective and the, the astral world. In the astral world you are a spirit which has a personality, which has its own emotions, its own thoughts, its own structure. And if you stop being or identifying with yourself and you start identifying with the whole, like I'm a part of the planet Earth or I'm a part of humanity or a part of uh, a god or a goddess, uh, or part of an egregore, then you start to move out of the astral into the true collective consciousness. Oh, yeah. Um, so the remark is, can it happen that you accidentally, or by an act of grace, fall into this collective astral while awake temporarily? Um, yes, it does. <laughs> um, it, it definitely does. It, it's usually also um, very akin to, to moments of inspiration. So sometimes a person is just sitting in the forest or um, eating or sleeping or relaxing and at the same time, that's in the same way that inspiration can come to a person, also uh, an entry into the collective consciousness can be made. So often when there are no challenges, no lower vibrations, no distractions, um, then the, the awareness which is focused on another can create a direct connection between you and the other. Um, kind of like a short circuit almost. Because within the, the, the collective astral, uh, thoughts, emotions, everything is clearly visible. So there's like an instant knowing, an instant understanding uh, in the of basketball. So it's a very easy place to communicate uh, telepathically. Well, yes, there's the remark that it is not only pleasant. <laughs> yes, it can be uh, confusing and also very much depending on what you're focusing on, it can be nice or not so nice to, to know or to realize or to feel. Um, but well, apparently if you are doing this then you should at least be friends enough with your, with your own body. So uh, you, should, you can always call upon yourself or to discipline yourself not to react and thereby not to suffer from the uh, 
from the knowledge which you're gaining by making this direct astral contact. to come back? Well, <coughs> um, the easiest way in general if you're to astral traveling is fear. Um, fear tends to um, um, pull the energies back into your body uh, because your body is like a fortress. that You can store energies within yourself and it is very hard for other beings from other levels of existence, both higher and lower, to break into your body, so it's kind of like your safe vault. And if you can manage to scare yourself, then your energy will almost instinctively return to your body and you will go back into a grounded state. It's not the most pleasant way of returning into an, or grounding, but it is a very quick and effective way uh, to do it. Uh, more slowly, um, it is basically by moving your awareness to your body. So feeling your feet, becoming aware of your breathing, feeling the ground on which you rest. Um, slowly uh, moving your fingers and feeling every movement. And especially if you move your fingers against yourself on your own body, feeling not just the movement of your finger, but also the change in pressure as your fingers move against your own skin. And by going actually into this um, yeah, physical awareness again, uh, the energy gets pulled back in, into um, yeah, where your attention is, because ultimately your uh, attention guides your energy. Um, the problem is usually happens if people don't want to go back, if part of them wants to stay in the astral and doesn't want to go back to the body, and then you've got a little rebellion on your hand. Um, and ultimately it's very important then to, to try to make the part of you which doesn't want to go back to realize that you should cooperate, both the part which wants to go back and not wants to go back, and that only by cooperating you can really work effectively, you can really get things done, and also to, in a way, to learn why doesn't that part want to go back and can I either develop coping skills so that part doesn't suffer as much or change my circumstances so it's not so bad to be back. Um, it's, uh, it can be a very uh, problematic thing if like a part of you doesn't want to be there because this can also result in a, a tear in your spirit so the part of your spirit leaves and then you have to try to reconnect to it when you're disincarnated or you might then incarnate in two bodies as two separate beings again so it's important to, to always maintain inner harmony and um, yeah, not to allow such, such injuries uh, to happen to you um, yes well how to develop coping skills well that's easier said than done <laughs> depends very much on the, on the situation you're in because in in general you can say that uh, uh, the spirit doesn't like being in a body because it is limited it's half blinded uh, it's in, in a very confused state if it goes into into a physical body um, but the reason for doing it is to work on itself or to manifest something in the world so uh, remembering your mission is also very helpful in that and coping skills depend very much on like what cosmos are you coming from um, what egregores are you connected to which gods are willing to guide you what experiences did you have in your previous lives and it's usually best to go with your strengths so look at also your your elements in which you're strong. Is your mind strong? Are you strong emotionally? Are you strong physically? Are you strong energetically? And try to resolve things by using your strength and to compensate your weakness. Um, 
it's getting really, really late. And well, as you might have noticed by the lesson starting rather late, I really had to rush here and I have another client in 15 minutes. Uh, so I want to try to eat something, so I'll have to cut it short. Um, we'll have another session uh, next week. And after that session I will be gone for a few for two weeks. So but you can send some uh, questions for uh, for the next week's uh, session. So I'll see you again on next week Thursday. Okay. Thank you very much and I think it was a very interesting lesson. Okay. Bye-bye.